Welcome to this session. We'd like to go ahead and get started. Uh, we, we're so happy to have Tab Benoit with us today. Um, and you all know about his honors, and, or you wouldn't be here. And so, <laughs> the man and his guitars. That's it? All right. Just put it on me, right? Say two. Say two. You're the man. I'm the man, and this is a guitar. Uh, thank you uh, for coming this afternoon. Uh, I don't know exactly what they want of me with my guitar, but uh, I guess y'all want me to play. Could I, could I ask you a question? Yeah, questions are welcome. Okay. Um, I'd like to know the, the, one of the first people that you heard that was a blues guitar player, and you said, man... That's what I want to do. Well, uh, it, the first time I really heard a guitar that's, that made me perk up to it was, uh, was a guy named Terry Kath who played for Chicago. And, uh, you know, back in the day, uh, my dad was a sh fan of Chicago, and, and I would listen to that stuff and play drums along to it, and then I'd hear this guitar playing, and I went, whoa, what is that? <laughs> I didn't really, you know, I didn't really want to play guitar. It wasn't my, my goal. But when I heard that, I was like, well, that, that could be fun. <laughs> and then uh, I started playing guitar uh, in, in church, you know. And I really wanted to play drums in church, but they wouldn't allow drums in church. <laughs> So a friend of mine stood up in, in class because I had a, had a teacher that was a guitar player in math class, and this is uh, sixth grade. And she said, "Are there any students that can play instruments? We want we're looking to spice up mass, you know." And, uh, and I stood up instantly. I went, "Yes, I play drums," because I figured it was a good way to get the drums back in the house because my mom, who's here, didn't want the drums in the house anymore. So I figured, you know, if I was playing for Jesus, <laughs> I might be able to get the drums back. <laughs> and it didn't work, because my teacher said, well, Monsignor, I don't think is going to allow drums in church. And then one of my friends stood up and said, yeah, but he plays guitar too. So uh, she said, uh, okay, is that true? And I went, well, I cannot tell a lie. Uh, yes, I, I do know how to play some guitar. I just gotten a guitar, you know. She says, "Well, show show me what you know." And I got up in front of the class, and uh, which is nerve wracking, almost like this. <laughs> so I got up in front of the class and I played something I had just learned. And she goes, "Wow, that's beautiful. What is that called?" And uh, I said, uh, "Stairway to Heaven." <laughs> And she went, that's beautiful. You got to play that in church. <laughs> the Monsignor is going to love that. Now, if it, people that don't know, that's a Led Zeppelin song. <laughs> that is really nothing about uh, church or heaven. <laughs> so I got away with it. I think I'm the only person in St. Francis Cathedral that played Led Zeppelin in church. <laughs> Any other questions? You ask it. Oh wait, my mom wants to say something. <laughs> well, 
And the cool thing about the banjo was uh, once I busted all the strings on it, it's a drum on a stick. <laughs> so I could walk around the house with the drum, which I thought was really excellent. So uh, anybody else? Yeah. What kind of pickups do you use? This is the stock guitar, the way it was built in 1972. Uh, no, I didn't change pickups or anything. Um, I mean, it had a much better paint job on it originally, but uh, you know, this is what years of using it for a living, I guess, does, you know? Sweat is a good paint stripper. No, uh, my guitar does not have a name. Uh, Fender, yeah. Come here, Fender. No, I never really gave it a name. I know like B.B. King and Lucille and all these guys, but I, you know, I never really thought about it. It was always a tool, a way to deliver the song. I mean, that's really what the guitar is. It's a, it's a tool to deliver a song. So, you know. Willie Nelson's known for getting people higher. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's what it's called, yeah. So this is the this is Tab Benoit and his guitar and his mom. <laughs> Y'all need to change the sign out there. All right, anybody else? Uh, okay. Well, when I really started deciding I was going to be a guitar player, um, I was always into the old blues stuff, you know. Um, I mean, obviously, you know, B.B. King and um, Muddy Waters and, and, you know, as far as guitar players, uh, you know, like John Lee Hooker and Lightning Hopkins, guys like that, you know. I like the guy who could just sit down by himself and play and entertain the audience with you know one person and, and it always seemed like that was the most um free you know as far as you, you're able to when you know when you don't have to lead the band around then you're free to go anywhere you know you, you, there's no rules so uh, to me that was the the biggest um way to express yourself was 
one person sitting down, being able to play whatever he feels with no rules, you know, and not, not having to tell the band, well, like, here's the beat, here's the chords, you know, and all of that's wide open, and I, I always love that. And then, you know, from there, it, I mean, obviously, got into guys like Buddy Guy and Albert King and Albert Collins and, you know, all, all of the blues greats, uh, you know, they were, there's a reason why they're called greats, you know, because <laughs> they were great. <clears throat> and and the blues always was the most expressive guitar playing I, that I'd ever heard. Um, and it's what started everything. It's what started rock and roll, started country music, you know, even to this day, uh, I mean, you got to say that rap and hip hop is is coming from blues from a long ways away, you know, but it's still all American music uh, seems to come from blues. And blues was a mixture of different cultures as it is, you know. So uh, it just was something I gravitated towards. I mean, my mom was like, why are you playing blues? You know, it doesn't make people rich and famous. And uh, I'm like, well, this is what I feel. This is what the only reason I was playing music in the first place was because it, I, I enjoyed the feeling of playing music and, and the feeling of uh, being able to interact with an audience through artwork, you know, and live artwork. You get to play in live music is you get to be a live artist, you know, and that's a, that, that was a, the attraction to me. I wasn't looking to be famous. I still, I'm still not. They just put me in that Hall of Fame and now I gotta, I'm gonna have to have security when I go to Home Depot. Uh, but, <laughs> but Dr. John was who, who really uh, was instrumental in getting me my first record deal, you know. My first lesson. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah, there was a there was a guitar teacher in my hometown um, who uh, he was he was a, a a great jazz guitar player and and there was a few jazz guitar players that came out of Homer, Louisiana. One, one Ron S J got famous for it and moved to L A. But um, so I went to go. My mom said, "Well, you know, uh, maybe you should take lessons." So here's the guy. So she brought me this guy, Kenny A. Bear. I go there for one day, you know, he, and he shows me what he was doing, and I showed him what I was doing, and he goes, I, you know, I can't help you. <laughs> <laughs> he says, if you don't learn how to play chords like this, I'm like, well, well, why not play it like this? And I played it my way, and he was like, well, I don't think I can do anything for you. Yeah. <laughs> well, um, my lessons have been on the road. You know, I'm on the road about half a year, and uh, you know, you, that's the best place to learn. I, I didn't. I, in fact, I really didn't start learning how to play guitar or play music until I made it my living. I think that was when it, when I started learning, because I thought I knew until I started paying the bills by it. You know. And then I went, whoa, this is different now. So, you know, now it means more, it means something different. It wasn't just, this is cool, this is fun with my friends. It's like, no, now this has to work. And, and I gotta make, make sure that uh, I'm, I'm, I'm getting people's attention with what I'm doing, because we're going to places that, where people have never heard of me before. You know, how do you, how do you walk up into an audience and that, that's never heard of you and, and grab them? You know, that's what you have to learn, <laughs> you know, because you don't, I mean, when you only have five people in a place and you're, you know, like, this is way more than my first gigs that we have right now. <laughs> but to, to keep those five people there is the hardest thing to do. It's easy to keep 5,000 people there because they came and they're ready and they, are, they, they got the energy with them. Five people is the hardest thing to keep, especially when it's your family and friends. <laughs> And they got in free, <laughs> but you know, it, uh, it's it's uh, it's been interesting, and uh, you know, I I really didn't think it would go this this long. You know, this is like 30 years of playing music for a living. You know, uh, I, I really I, I my pilot's license is still good. I was flying airplanes uh, before I was doing this, so I, you know, if I needed to go back to it, I had a backup plan. And, and uh, I still do, just in case. 
you know, in case y'all don't like this. I'll call Charlie Hammers, I'll get my job right back. But, uh, you know, anybody else? Do you ever play the acoustic guitar on stage? Yeah, no, not on stage, uh, I mean at home. On stage it's just kind of hard to get a good acoustic guitar sound, especially after I've been playing loud electric guitar all night. If you pick up an acoustic and sit down with it, the crowd goes, uh, it's time to get a corn dog. <laughs> oh, well, well, yeah, but did I play that? Yeah, I played that on acoustic in the studio, you know. But in, in live, it doesn't, it doesn't play like that, you know. Thank you. Should I play it? Yeah. All right. Right after this. Uh, I want to, you know, I, that seems to be the going trend is to go back to vinyl. Or I could just wait until the CD comes back around. <laughs> Might have to be a pilot first. <laughs> yeah. In another 30 years, the CD is going to come back, you know. All right, let me play one for y'all. She was mine and I was fine back then I tried to say how much I loved her till the end But there were times I could have said what I want to But now she's gone and I'm the long, lonely by you. I'm filling up from the rain The still waters are killing my veins My heart, Lord, is drifting Like an old P-Roll That's been untied Got no place to go. I find it hard to snake my way through the trees. I can't even find a push from a breeze. I was a man who found a love so true. But now she's gone, and I'm the long, lonely by you. I'm filling up from the rain The still waters are killing my veins My heart, Lord, is drifting Like an old P-Ro That's been untied Got no place to go I find it hard to snake my way through the trees I can't even get a push from a breeze 
I was a man who found a love so true But now she's gone And I'm the lone, lonely by you Now she's gone, y'all And I'm the lone, lonely by you Now what? Hey, Jack, how was the report, uh, IMAX? An IMAX movie. Uh, well, I think they might want to know about that. In fact, the talk I'm doing after this is about Voice of the Wetlands. But uh, yeah, when I started Voice of the Wetlands, uh, these guys from IMAX came up to me and asked me if uh, I'd be interested in doing a movie about it. And I went, yeah, of course. <laughs> Uh, and it was actually something that started after Hurricane Lily, which was two years before Katrina, which did a bunch of damage down on the coast down where I live. I, I live in Homa, for y'all that don't know, um, which we just had Barry in our backyard. But um, so they came, they came to me, and, and the, the movie was actually called uh, Hurricane Warning. It was about what would happen if a major hurricane hit the coast of Louisiana, and then uh, in particular, you know, how New Orleans would fare because we've lost so much coastline that used to protect us in, uh, since, you know, the, the late 20s when they channeled the river off and, and decided to stop the delta from building. So it's either building or it's eroding. So now it's eroding and it's eroding, well, now it's an acre an hour. That's how fast. So uh, while we were doing that film, um, we were setting up all of these things about what would happen. And uh, right on cue, right at the end of filming, um, Katrina happened, you know, it hit. And we, we had to wait a, a week or two to find out what was going on. And if we were even gonna have a movie, I thought the movie was done because it was called Hurricane Warning which was supposed to try to help to warn people and uh, and then boom uh, we already knew uh what was going to happen now but uh when the when I mean, the director and the producers finally got in touch with me because i mean remember cell service was tough everything was tough around that time down there it's hard hard to communicate when i finally got word that no this is exactly what we were talking about and we got to go in there and finish it um then I saw some things take place that were ridiculously uh, like like you get going. This guy, this movie had to be made because there's no way you could write this. Like uh, they already sent the camera home that could hold this big IMAX camera. This big heavy camera that's actual film. This is not digital. And those big rolls of film are huge. The film's that thick, and uh, so it's flying around on a helicopter. Well, they had sent the helicopter home because we were done with the aerial photography part of it. Well, Katrina hits, and we need a helicopter. We got to get up in the air to fly this camera around. Well, the only one that was available was a helicopter that was being used to film the Miami Vice movie with Will Smith at the same time. So, and this, this helicopter was doubling as a police helicopter and a camera helicopter, so it had fake Miami police decals on it. <laughs> like movie Miami police decals. And uh, they flew right into the city. And nobody was allowed in the city, especially flying anything, unless, you know, they were allowed to by Homeland Security. Well, Homeland Security looked at it like, hey, that's Miami police coming to help. <laughs> so they got in. And they went, well, copy, they called back to Houston and said, we got to copy those stickers and put them on our trucks, on our boats. We got to put, <laughs> we got to get uniforms. And it's, and it's fake Miami police decals, you know, that they were using 
to get into the city and finish filming the story while it was going on. So it was a, it was a feat, but I couldn't believe they were pulling it off like that, you know. And and it was it was difficult for the helicopter guys because th those cameras can only handle well that that film's turning. They they get three minutes of filming for one reel. It's a thousand foot of film on a reel, so it's three minutes they get out of that. So they had to land often to reload the camera. And every time they land, and the helicopter pilots are going, we got to go help those people. They're on their rooftops. They're waving at us. They think we're come we're coming to rescue them. It's like what well, we. We can't rescue them. We're not set up for that. Go back in there. You have to film this. We have to finish this story. And uh, that's that's a credit to the director because with all of this big thing that's going on down there, this guy still has the mindset to keep focused on what we're trying to accomplish. And uh, if you y'all got to go check out the the film. It's called Hurricane on the Bayou, and uh, it's still available. It's still playing at the IMAX in New Orleans. Um, I think it's on Netflix, uh, but you can find it, and it's it's a real story. It's covering this covering this in real life, uh, you know, in real time, with following real people around, and a lot of musicians. Alan Toussaint's in it, Amanda Shaw, Chubby Carrier. Um, it's a it's a great movie and a great story, you know. That that God wrote. Anybody else? Should I just play another song? All right, but here's a song uh, my mom's going to be uh, happy about. Because uh, my grandpa, Anatol Babin, was a, was a musician. That was, we always were trying to beg him to play music for us. He was a, he was a fiddle player and a harmonica player. And uh, we always, you know, come up and Paul, play for us. You know, he go, oh, all right, y'all sit down, be quiet. But after this, y'all got to go do do, which means y'all got to go to sleep. All he was trying to do was get us to go to sleep. Because we broke a lot of stuff. <laughs> so, uh, but he had, this, he had this story to try to get us to go to sleep. He, he made up this thing called the Stackalina, which is some kind of swamp creature. Now, you don't really have to make up a swamp creature to scare people. <laughs> Swamps pretty much scare people as it is. They already got creatures out there that are man-eaters. But he made up a new one called the Stackalina. And he would go out, <laughs> he'd go, if y'all don't go to sleep, the stack of Lena is going to eat y'all. <laughs> now, I didn't think that was a good way to try to get kids to go to sleep. <laughs> I never heard of scaring kids to sleep, but he would go out there and he would scratch on the screens. <laughs> and he would bang on the side of the house and he would get in the doorway and pull his neck like, <laughs> stack of Lena's got me, y'all need to go to sleep now. <laughs> None of this is making us drowsy. <laughs> so, you know, later on, I was out in, the, I, I like to ride out in the swamp. I, yeah, I love to go in a boat and, and, and or, or go to my camp, which is not there after Hurricane Barry anymore. But I like to go out there and write, you know, and this song just kind of wrote itself, you know. So let me, let me play it for y'all. <laughs> Hey, 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 stack of Lena. Well, I'm only trying to see you. Oh, stack of Lena. You really must be a sight. You only come out at night. Say, hey, 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 stack of Lena. Well, I know just where you've been. Cause I've been there too, old stack of Lena. Well, you're scratching on my screen, though. Don't scare me no more. Thank you. 
I think you only get meaner or stack leaner. You've been making all that noise, trying to scare them little by you, boy. Scratching on my screen, though, don't scare me no more. Oh, no. Go ahead, scratch it now. Go ahead, scratch it now. Go ahead, scratch. Anybody else? Have you always been a finger picker? No, I play with a pick most of the time. Do you? Except when I'm playing solo. If I'm playing solo, then I can do more things with your fingers, you know, mm -hmm. with the bass line and kind of, you know, keep things going rhythmically with your fingers, yeah. you know. If you can play solo, I feel like the fingers is the best way to go. Unless you're strumming chords and, you know, doing uh, Hank going. Williams songs, yeah. you know. <laughs> Um, well, the way I met Dr. John was, uh, I was playing at, uh, the Mid-City Lanes, which is now the Rock and Bowl, but back then, it wasn't called the Rock and Bowl yet, it was just a bowling alley that had a jam night, and you get up on the jam night and you had 12 minutes, or three songs, whichever came first. The dude had a timer, too, he had a timer, one of them cooking timers. He was set to 12 minutes, and if your 12 minutes was up, he'd come on the stage and hold it in your face <laughs> and say, it's ringing, you know. So, uh, you know, I was there one night. I, I used to go there all the time. It was a great way to, to, to meet people, because I'm from Homer. I'm not from New Orleans. And, you know, I felt like I needed to get into the New Orleans music scene to even have a chance at a career at this, because that is where you can make a living playing music, you know. And the way to get heard was to play for free whenever you could, you know, and play for wherever you could. So Rock and Bowhead started this jam night, and uh, I was there one night and played my three songs, and uh, this lady comes up to me and says that, you know, well, she's all dressed up like a voodoo uh, priestess, you know, and uh, I'm like, uh, hello, <laughs> did I do something wrong? <laughs> Is there a doll in your purse that represents me? And she says, no, uh, my name's B.B., I'm Dr. John's manager, 
and uh, we just lost our guitar player and we need one like right now can you leave tomorrow <laughs> like jump on the bus we gotta go you know and uh i was like what uh, i didn't know if it was i was looking for the candid camera like <laughs> is this a joke uh well and we started talking more and uh and she realized well you know what scratch that you know um but there's a project that that dr john's on called uh blues guitars for the homeless because dr john had actually you know or mac rebenak is his real name uh he actually started on guitar in fact that's him playing the guitar on all of the professor long hair records you know so um he's uh he's a guitar player which i didn't know either you know until that point and and uh they were doing this album and they were looking for somebody new that was unknown to give him a break, I guess, and put him on this on this record that was going to go worldwide. And they were looking for two songs, and uh, that's that's pretty much how I started. I mean, I, I I did two songs for that album, and uh, one of them called "Nice and Warm," which is something I wrote the night before we went in the studio, and it was one of them things where I thought it it was so vivid in my mind I couldn't sleep. First of all, I was, I, was going, I was a little anxious. This is my first foray into recording with a, in a professional studio. And uh, I mean, obviously I was having a hard time sleeping anyway, but every time I would fall asleep, this song would keep popping in my head. And I, I mean, I swear I could hear the whole song. So I thought it was somebody else's song. So uh, when we got to the studio, I played about four or five songs and they went, all right, that's good. And uh, I was about to pack up and I said, wait, hold on, there's a song that's, that was stuck in my head and I, it was keeping me awake. I don't know if it's my, if I wrote this in my sleep or if somebody else did it or I heard it somewhere, but let's just play it, let's just record it. And uh, the band never heard it, I never played it before, but I, it was vivid, you know, and I just told the band to follow me, it's a straight blues MB and I, in fact, that, that take, the first time we played the song is the take that's on the CD, it's on the, that, made it, the, that made the record. And then after that, the record label that was putting that CD out, Justice Records, said, well, let's look at doing a deal for you. And instead of, you know, just a compilation record, let's make a full album, you know. And Nice and Warm, we recut right Nice and Warm, and that became the title track for my first CD, you know. Nice and warm. Okay. A uh, blues guitars for the homeless. So, uh, nice and warm. Okay. Let's see if I can play it without the band. <laughs> I'm gonna play it in A, so I don't have to sing so high because when I recorded this the first time. I was in my early 20s. <laughs> and my voice was much higher than it is now. to get back home where the sun is always nice and warm I 
Can't wait to get back home Where the sun is always nice and warm You know it's been freezing out here The howling wind sends a nasty chill through my bones You know I shivered myself to sleep last night The cold just wouldn't let me be That's when I woke up and realized, y'all This ain't no place for me And I can't wait to get back home Where the sun is always nice and warm You know it's been freezing out here, y'all, all alone The howling wind sends a nasty chill through my bones And they all took me away From this old alley To a, a warm place that I could play Yeah, yeah, yeah And I can't wait to get back home Where the sun is always nice and warm Well, I'm so happy to be here, yeah, 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 with y'all And that old nasty chill, Lord, is gone Thank you all so much. <laughs> that concludes uh, the man and his guitar and his mama and his aunt and his cousins and his cousin's husband. <laughs> the next, uh, the next uh, thing I'm going to be doing is still right here in this room. When is that? In, in, at two. At two? Oh, so in about seven minutes, <laughs> which means I got to clear out because I heard the next guy up is really hard to deal with, <laughs> which is me. <laughs> all right. So uh, thank you all for listening to A Man and His Guitar. <laughs>